Hello and welcome to today's presentation. We hope someday soon we'll be able to meet in person, but not just yet. My name is Sean Swanick and I'm the librarian for Middle East and Islamic Studies at Duke University. This is the first talk in an informal series I put together that brings together scholars and collections. I wanna thank our organizers and sponsors, the Duke Middle East Studies Center, the Duke University Libraries, the Duke Islamic Studies Center, Art, Art History and Visual Studies, and the Center for Jewish Studies. I also wanna thank Griffin Orlando, Dumas Program Assistant for taking care of so many different details. A bit of housekeeping. Upon conclusion of the talk, if you'd like to ask questions, please raise your hand. Look in the lower right-hand corner, and click on reactions and you'll see a hand raised. Or insert your question into the chat and I'll read it on your behalf. I'll add that at the end of the talk, we will also discuss family histories and share a few links to help one think about one's own family tales. Today's presentation will focus on a ceramicist who survived the Armenian genocide in Turkey in the 20th century. Late last year, the Manuscripts Migration Lab, a project investigating provenance of Duke's manuscript and papyri collections, hosted a mini symposium about cultural heritage. One of the presenters was Hagnar Watampah, whose book, The Missing Pages, The Modern Life of a Medieval Manuscript from Genocide to Justice, focused on a survivor object, namely, the story of the Zeytun Gospels, a manuscript born in a small remote village in present day Turkey, and how some of those folios from that manuscript found their way to the Getty Museum in the United States. That presentation is available here and I'll put it in the chat in a moment. It was an excellent symposium dealing with a wide variety of collecting, collections and issues of power. Today's discussion will continue that conversation. Before introducing today's speaker, I would be remiss if I did not promote the good work of my colleague, Eric Zitzer, the Librarian for Slavic, Eurasian, and Eastern European Studies. Many will not recall that Raphael Lemkin spent some time at Duke University, and for whom our presenter will further discuss momentarily. In a similar light, today's presenter will focus on a tale of survival, genocide, and art. Sato Mugalian, is the author of Feast of Ashes, The Life and Art of David Ohanassian. For more than a decade, she conducted archival research in Armenia, Turkey, Israel, Palestine, England, and France. How fortunate is he, of course, to trace the history of her grandfather, ceramicist David Ohanassian, in search for his extant tile installations. Miss Mugalian contains multitudes. When she is not researching and writing, she is a professional flutist in New York City with more than 35 chamber music recordings to her credit and the artistic director of Perspectives Ensemble, founded at Columbia University in 1993 to explore and contextualize the works of composers and visual artists. Ms. Mugalian serves as principal flutist of American Modern Ensemble in Gotham Chamber Opera and, can, and can be heard on Spotify, YouTube, and all major music platforms. Perhaps after the talk, she would like to perform her favorite song for us. The final sentence of Sato's book reads, and at the end of all my searching, I had arrived where I'd started and had known it for the first time. An eloquent sentence and thought to be sure. And with that, I'd like to welcome Ms. Sato Mugalia. Thank you so much. Sean, that was like an amazing introduction. I hope I can live up to your confidence. <laughs> I'm uh, really honored to be here with you all at Duke University Libraries in the virtual world and the Middle East Study Center and um, want to thank them and the co-sponsors. And of course, I want to thank Sean Swanick and Griffin Orlando and Ellen McClarney for organizing this event and for inviting me to speak in connection with the subject of my recent book which as Sean said, was the biography of my grandfather, David Ohanessian. So Ohanessian is known um, as the person who founded a very popular Jerusalem art known today as Armenian ceramics. And as we'll see in the course of the talk, the story of this very iconic art is deeply entwined with the history of the Armenian genocide, a period of mass violence, forced displacement and expropriation initiated by the young Turk government in 1915 under the cover of World War I, in which most of the Ottoman Empire's more than 2 million Armenians were massacred, expelled, conscripted into labor gangs, abducted, tortured, or left to die of hunger and disease 
during months long marches or in internment camps in the Syrian desert. So many of you, of course, um, already know, and, and Sean just reminded us that the word genocide itself was coined by the Polish Jewish jurist, Raphael Lemkin in 1943-44. And uh, as you also just learned, as I learned from Sean just a few weeks ago, that in 1941-42, during a time of great peril to European Jews, Lemkin spent a year at Duke University. During his time in North Carolina, he continued to think deeply about what he had initially called crimes of barbarity, which for him included trade in slaves, trade in women and children, and attacks carried out against an individual as a member of a collectivity with the goal being not only to harm that individual, but also to cause damage to the collectivity to which that individual belongs. So Lemkin is remembered for having created an international legal framework for these crimes against humanity, what we call genocide today. And he had been inspired in part as a response to the treatment of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. And of course, the Nazi attempts to exterminate Europe's Jews and Roma. He himself had lost nearly 50 family members in the Holocaust. So this was a critical and very personal body of thought for him that evolved over time. And I would certainly recommend that you have a look in uh, Duke's Lemkin archives and urge you all to read a fantastic article by Duke librarian Eric Sitzer. By doing so, you'll learn something about his process. And especially I'm talking, addressing to any students who might be here, you'll see that Lemkin's arrival at the word and definition of genocide was actually the product of many years of deep and urgent consideration. So, Turning to my subject for today, we'll see that Armenian ceramics that are such a characteristic art of Jerusalem are also not a static story. They're not simply lovely tiles with gorgeous glazes, but they contain their own narrative. These ceramic works that we'll see today are the result of human conflict and forced migration, as well as individual agency and perseverance as lived out under the tumultuous forces of empire and nationalism and colonialism. I could not have reconstructed the history of this art nor written this book without the efforts of my mother, my aunts and uncles and cousins to safeguard pieces of our family's collective heritage. So today I'd like to give you some kind of granular history of the art, but equally I hope to provide some encouragement and later on some tools for, for preserving your own family stories for yourself, for those of you who are interested, but also because I believe that at some point in the future, your story, your family's experience of humanity will illuminate history in a way that nothing else can. So to begin, here's my maternal grandfather, David Ohnesian, a ceramicist who left his enduring mark on the face of Jerusalem. And as Sean mentioned, uh, Feast of Ashes is his biography and the product of 10 years of research and travel in search of his works. So to give you a brief summary first, in the years before World War I, Ohnesian was a renowned master of the Ottoman Kutahia ceramics tradition. In early 1916, during the period of the Armenian Genocide, he, my grandmother, and their three small children were deported from Kutahia towards Syria. After surviving three bleak years as a refugee in Aleppo and Meskene, the Ohanesians resettled in 1918 in Jerusalem, where my grandfather re-established his art. So today we'll see some of his most characteristic works, I'll give you some background on the centuries old artistic tradition he inherited in Ottoman Anatolia, some details of the historic and political contexts that played a role in his work. And finally, we'll see how my grandfather's pre-World War I career in Kutahia, as well as his migrations played a crucial role in the recreation of this tradition and left us an artistic legacy that continues to flourish in Jerusalem today. Ohanessian's Jerusalem workshop produced pottery as well as tiles, distinguished by intense saturated glazes and a mix of opaque and translucent glazes. So now I'm guessing that at least some of you have been to Jerusalem and if you have put a little yes or no in the Q&A in, in the chat box so I can see it at the Q&A. 
So for those of you who have been to Jerusalem or those of you who look forward to it, as you walk around the old city, um, you'll undoubtedly have seen these Armenian shops featuring these beautiful displays of colorfully glazed pottery and tiles. And as you walk around outside the old city, if you look up, you'll see these brilliant blue and green tiles that splash color against Jerusalem's gold building stones. These are all the work of David Ohanesian. And once you start looking for them, you'll see his tiles all around. So in fact, Ohanesian's Armenian ceramics in Jerusalem are so well integrated into the cityscape that international film and art directors often use them as a kind of visual shorthand for the city. So here we see a screenshot from this uh, 2012 film, which depicts on Hannah Arendt's first day in Jerusalem and the director or the art director has seated her in front of Ohanesian ceramics. And here's another kind of commonly seen scene, a press conference at the very luxurious American Colony Hotel in Jerusalem. And these two writers have been seated in front of Ohanesian's Jerusalem ceramics. In 2003, the Israeli Postal Service celebrated Armenian ceramics with a series of commemorative stamps. And since the founding of the art in 1919, it has achieved a global reach. So there are examples in museums, public structures, and homes all over the world. But as I alluded to earlier, it's the story behind this popular art that's much less well known. In 1986, the Aretz Museum in Tel Aviv organized the first formal museum exhibition of the Armenian pottery of Jerusalem, and curator Yael Olenek recognized it as a distinct art, a separate branch of the larger field of Ottoman ceramics. As we learned a minute ago, Ohanesian's career bridged two schools of ceramic making, Kutahia and Jerusalem, the former acknowledged as the inspiration for the latter. And each of these two schools has been surveyed by specialist art historians, but this huge gap remained over the question of just how exactly the art moved from one place to the other. Now, I understood as the granddaughter that the answer to that question was directly tied to Ohanesian's arrest and deportation from Kutahia in 1916, and that this was a subject that no one seemed to want to discuss. Since the publication of that 1986 exhibit catalog, I followed the emerging literature and although parts of Ohanesian's story had been told, almost every text contained very significant errors about him. And I found that especially in the writings of British historians, he was often portrayed as a voiceless, powerless artisan dependent on the benevolence of British mandate patrons. Although he died before he, I was born, I knew that in actuality, he had been a person of enormous drive and agency. So to counter all of this in writing Feast of Ashes, I wanted to draw a much clearer line between the first half of his career and the second, and also memorialize his journey from Kutahia to Jerusalem. So let's look briefly at his early years in Kutahia and the circumstances of his artistic tradition in the Ottoman Empire. First, uh, a few maps. So here's a map of the Ottoman Empire as a reference point and the colored sections illustrate it at its greatest expanse toward the end of the 17th century. Um, this red outline that you see um, delineates the Anatolian Peninsula, which is most of what constitutes the modern Republic of Turkey. So a great part of these expansions were due to the conquests of the most familiar of the Ottoman sultans, Suleiman the Magnificent, who also played a role in the story of Ottoman ceramics. From the time of its founding around the year 1299, the Ottoman Empire expanded east, uh, well, expanded outward through conquest, uh, conquering some lands that were historically populated with Armenians. And uh, although this is a complicated story, the story of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, um, at the turn of the 20th century, with this pink shading, we see the six provinces in the eastern part of the Ottoman Empire that were commonly referred to as the Armenian provinces. And then uh, a little farther east um, in the Russian Empire, the province of Erevan, which is most of what constitutes today the modern Republic of Armenia. So um, just for comparison, here's a map of the modern Middle East and circled in red are the cities that played an important role in the life of Ohanesian. 
So he was born in 1884 in the village of Muracha, and he spent his youth in Eskashir. Like many rural families, our family maintained a strong tradition of storytelling and the knowledge of births and deaths and marriages, professions, all of this were passed down through the generations around the hearth on cold winter nights. So in this way, young Tabit learned that he was in part descended from men who had traveled to the historic Ottoman ceramic center of Kutahya to learn this art. And similarly, my mother as a child in Palestine also learned the history of her ancestors. And in the last years of her life, she transcribed all of these stories and made copies for every member of my generation. So I've woven a lot of these narratives into Feast of Ashes to kind of give a sense of Ottoman Armenian village life and family life within the Armenian community of Jerusalem between the two world wars. So from my mother's account, I learned that in 1902, Ohnesian at the age of 17, followed in the footsteps of his ancestors, moved to Kutahia and pursued an apprenticeship. So at that time, the turn of the century, there were two ceramic studios in the city, one owned by a Turkish master, Mehmet Emin, and one led by the Armenian brothers, Garabed and Harutun Minasyan. By 1907, Ohanesian had mastered the art and he opened his own studio called the Société Ottoman de Fayence. And here we see his letterhead in three languages, which is kind of unusual because in Kutahia, in sort of uh, an interior part of the uh, Ottoman Anatolia, um, Turkish was the only language that was spoken. Here we see Ottoman Turkish on the top, French in the middle, which was the international language of trade in the Ottoman Empire, and then Armenian at the bottom. And because there may be others among us today who equally miss archives, I'm just inserting this shot of uh, me in the Mark Sykes archive in Hull, moments after I discovered the letterhead that you just saw, and these are the librarians, um, the blessed librarians who helped me find it. So, okay, back to Kutakia. Here's a tectonic map now of this uh, complex region of the Western Anatolian Peninsula. You see the intersection, the collision of these plates. Um, so the rich deposits of clays and other minerals that were a result of this tectonic complexity gave rise over time to glazed ceramics as well as two other distinctive art forms. Both of these had deep Armenian participation that relied on the local natural resources. So the cities of Kutahia and Ushak, somewhere to the south, produced brilliantly colored carpets using local plant and mineral dyes and locally raised wool and silk. And there's another very unusual art form, these miniature mirsham or lule dashe carvings associated with Eskishir, which are made from magnesium silicate, which is a kind of soapy white mineral that abounds in the regions of Eskashihir and Kutakia, but it's found in very few other places in the world. So when we're looking at these sort of very specific, very localized arts in the context of migration, we have to remember that artisanal practices like these that rely on highly localized materials often cannot survive the migration journey. And that's something that we need to bear in mind as we think about the story of ceramics as well. One last map, a satellite view of Western Anatolia, Turkey. So at the top in the red circle, we see the town of Iznik, which was the chief imperial ceramic making center of the Ottoman Empire and gave its name to a school of ceramic making characterized by very formal styles with repeating floral and geometric patterns that cater to the tastes of the Ottoman imperial court. And 100 miles to the south, also in red, we see the second Ottoman ceramic center of Kutahya. So both these regions shared rich supplies of borax, quartz, chrome, cobalt, manganese, and especially kaolin, which is a soft white china clay that produces this characteristic luminous white background that we see in the finest Iznik and Kutahya ware. So for the Ottoman court, the acquisition of these intricate and labor intensive works of art served as an expression of imperial wealth, power and taste. And at the height of the Iznik tradition around the 16th century age of Suleiman the Magnificent, ceramicists produced these exquisitely refined works. We can see in this piece, the influence of Chinese blue and white porcelain, 
because all of these were passing along these major trade routes. So the influences suffused in, in across uh, different local arts. Um, to make it a little bit more obvious, I'm put side by side an early 15th century Chinese blue and white grapes dish, and then from a century later, the Isnik version. Also in the 16th century, tiles and tiled monuments took on an important role, and Ottoman sultans and other elites commissioned Isnik tiles for their own future tombs, mosques, and palaces. And here in this photo, we see the really spectacular tiling of the Rustem Pasha Mosque, which some of you may have visited in Istanbul. So this represents the peak of Iznik tile production. And the mosque itself was designed by the greatest classical Ottoman architect, Mimar Sinan. So Kutahya, as you remember, to the south with its own mineral wealth, but somewhat farther away from Constantinople, the capital, was a, a secondary ceramic center but often cooperated with the Iznik workshops, took on overflow from imperial orders. But surviving labor agreements inform us that Kutahya was historically dominated by Armenian ceramicists. And these Armenians and Greeks and the Turks who were there developed some unique styles, including these distinctive and immediately recognizable coffee cups and pots, these sort of playful figural styles, and also, um, they produced a wealth of Christian votive objects, like these eggs adorned with cherubim and crosses. Now, by the early 18th century, for a variety of reasons, the ceramic production in Iznik pretty much collapsed. And instead, huge commissions began to arrive in Kutahya, including orders from Jerusalem's Armenian Patriarchate. And here we see the interior of St. James Cathedral in Jerusalem. Um, Around 1718, the Armenian Patriarchate also commissioned a series of Armenian inscribed pictorial tiles illustrating scenes from the gospels. And at the same time through these centuries, the renovation of externally tiled monuments throughout the Ottoman lands also provided a lot of trade for the Kutahya ceramicists. So the same tectonic complexity that made the Anatolian Peninsula rich in minerals also subjected it to frequent earthquakes, and blizzards and harsh sun would damage the tiles, necessitating a continual production of replacement tiles. But by the middle of the 19th century, severely deteriorating economy in the Ottoman Empire left the city's trade subdued and major monuments were falling into poor repair. Ironically, it was yet another devastating earthquake in Bursa in 1845 that caused a lot of damage to the city's tiled monuments that gave some energy to Kutahya ceramics trade. And a powerful Ottoman statesman, whom many of you, you might already know his name, Osman Hamdi Bey, engaged the Kutahya tile makers. Um, as we see in the Ottoman Empire, tiles served as a really important form of cultural production, of material culture, and they not only linked every generation of ceramicists to the Anatolian lands, to the Anatolian soil and resources, but also connected them with successive dynasties of the Ottoman imperial house. So this influential statesman, Osman Hamdi Bey, was also a painter himself who epitomized the Orientalist highly decorative style he repeatedly advocated support for the Kutahya industry and argued that it was essential not to neglect the old crafts that had flourished in the 15th and 16th centuries eras, the time of the empire's greatest expanse and power. And so often you see in his paintings, uh, tiled revetments, which evoke a sense of the magnificent Ottoman past. Hamdi Bey also included displays of Kutahya wear in European exhibitions, including in Paris and Vienna. And by doing so, he was drawing attention to the city's artistic legacy. So with this impetus from the capital, the Kutahya ceramicists were working very hard to uh, regain the refined techniques perfected by their ancestors as they were exporting very large quantities of ceramics to uh, Europe and elsewhere. But as they focused on this revival, the conditions around them were deteriorating. In 1875, the Ottoman government declared sovereign bankruptcy, defaulting on huge debts. 
1877-78, there was a war with Russia that resulted in the loss of many territories and it accelerated the migration of Muslims from these lost European and Caucasus provinces into Anatolia. Between 1894 and 96, under Sultan Abdul Hamid II, also known as the Bloody Sultan, as you see in this caricature poster, there were horrific massacres of Armenians, hundreds of thousands in the eastern provinces and thousands more in Constantinople itself. So these, democratic, these demographic changes really roiled the Ottoman Empire. And by the turn of the 20th century, we see this growing kind of Ottoman nationalism, cries for a more clearly defined Turkish cultural identity. And out of all these impulses, a new revivalist architectural style emerged that combined distinctive features of classical Ottoman and Seljuk monuments, including domes, wide eaves, pointed arches, and of course, tiled facades. Here we see a commission from the government 1904, a grand post office in Sirkaji, and all the Kuchakia workshops produced tiles for it. And I'm just including this. This is a small mosque behind the post office where you can clearly see the beauty of Kutahia production at this moment. Here's an archival trace, uh, a page of an Ottoman trade journal from 1913. So um, in with the founding of Ohanessian's workshop in 1907, Kutahia had three major studios, again, that of Mehmet Emin, of the Minassian brothers, and now also of David Ohanessian, whose name is misspelled, but you can still tell that it's him. By 1908, we have the Young Turk Revolution, which overturned Ottoman dynastic rule, and it inspired great optimism among the people, uh, including the Armenians, with the slogans of liberty, equality, and fraternity, which you see uh, written in Armenian on this, uh, this plate, this celebratory plate. So this new young Turk government addressed the accumulated damage to the great historic monuments, and all three Kutahia studios worked closely with the director, Ahmed Kemalatin, Nimar Kemalatin, to produce renovation tiles. And in this period, David Ohanessian achieved renown for his skill in historic renovations. And today, as you walk around Istanbul, you see quite a lot of buildings um, that were constructed in this nationalist style. I mean, it's called first nationalist style now, it was called Ottoman revivalist style back then, but many of them feature these beautiful tiles, which were made in Kutahya in these few years before World War I. You see them on the uh, ferry landings, and quite remarkably, you see even in the tomb of the penultimate Ottoman Sultan, uh, Sultan Rashad V, uh, the tile work of Armenian and Turkish ceramicists of Kutahya, including my grandfather from this early 20th century period. So Ohanessian's career extended beyond the Ottoman Empire. Um, around 1910, Egyptian Prince Muhammad Ali Tufik commissioned him to produce tiles for his new Maniel Palace in Cairo. But it was in October of 1911 that Ohanessian met somebody who would change the course of his life. A British member of parliament, Mark Sykes, whom many of us uh, know as the author, co-author of the infamous 1916 Sykes-Picot Treaty, traveled to Istanbul on a diplomatic mission. And during this trip, he detoured to Kutahya. He was looking for a ceramicist because several months earlier, his family manor in Yorkshire called Sledmir House had burned to the ground. And as Sykes rebuilt, he wanted to add a completely tiled room in the Oriental style. And he gave Ohanessian this enormous commission. After the tiles were installed in early 1914, lots of visitors from Sir Mark's aristocratic social circle and the British Foreign Office visited the rebuilt Sledmir House. They admired Ohanessian's work. And chief among these visitors was Sykes's very good friend, Ronald Storrs. So this outpouring of success would fade with the Ottoman entry into war in 1914. In January, the Ottoman army suffered a disastrous loss in the Battle of Sarikamish. And within weeks, the government began rounding up, massacring, and exiling Armenians in the provinces. And as many of you know, because I saw a lot of Armenian names joining, on the evening of April 24th, 1915, the young Turk regime arrested more than 200 Armenian luminaries in Constantinople and exiled them to the interior, where most were later murdered. In December of 1915, 
Onesian himself was arrested and falsely accused of engaging in revolutionary activity. So he, his wife, and their three young children were deported from Kutahia, traveling along the rail line to its end in Bozanti. And from there, caravans of Armenians, including my grandparents and their young children, were marched through the Taurus and Amanus Mountains toward the Arab provinces. Now, these photos do not depict my own family, but the conditions are very close to what my grandparents had described. These are the caravans of Armenians who are being marched in the Armenian genocide. And during the long fort forced march that my grandparents did embark upon, uh, my grandfather contracted a very serious case of typhus and almost died, but the family reached Aleppo later in 1916. In December of 1917, British General Edmund Allenby and his army conquered Jerusalem, bringing to an end four centuries of Ottoman rule. Ronald Storrs was installed as the new military governor of Jerusalem, and he faced many urgent problems, including starvation and the arrival of thousands of refugees, including orphans, orphaned Armenian children. Beyond the famine, the dysentery, and malaria, Storrs and his fellow British officers were also confronted with a need to repair the city. Uh, many of them had studied classics at Cambridge or Oxford. They were attuned to the needs of historic preservation in this most historic of all cities. And Storrs recruited designers and architects from abroad and appointed leaders from Jerusalem's diverse religious communities to oversee all the planning that fell outside the scope of a military administration. So in September of 1918, this new pro-Jerusalem society, as it was called, began its official duties. And high on their list was the restoration of the major holy sites, and especially the Dome of the Rock, which had been recovered in ceramic tiles in the 16th century by Suleiman the Magnificent. And here you see a close-up where you see the totally patchwork condition, tiles have fallen off, they're mismatched. Uh, by the end of the war, they were in perilous condition, and like all other externally tiled monuments, had needed regular attention. But in addition to the war and other conditions, Palestine's parched landscape lacked the clays and other minerals necessary to match the original work. So in the centuries following Suleiman's tiling, artisans carrying materials would come to <coughs> Jerusalem every few decades. Um, and they would produce new tiles and then return to their home regions. So in 1918, Governor Storrs invited two British experts, including the architect Ernest T. Richmond. Um, Richmond surveyed the Dome of the Rock and he wondered whether it would be possible to continue this practice of tile restoration. Uh, another expert, Charles Ashby, who was a leader in the British arts and crafts movement asked the same question. So Ashby hoped to introduce some traditional workshops for glass blowing, weaving, and tile making as resident arts in Jerusalem. But none of these men had any idea like who might have sufficient expertise to lead a tile workshop in Jerusalem. And messages started to fly around the uh, British networks like inquiring who knows anything about uh, tiles and where we can find them. Meanwhile, in November of 1918, a British Foreign Office mission led Mark Sykes to Jerusalem. Um, I'm hearing somebody's uh, squeaking going, so if you could mute your microphone, that would be wonderful. So um, Mark Sykes came to Jerusalem on his way to a foreign office mission in Aleppo and walking around the city with uh, stores, he too saw the precarious condition of the tiles. Now, once Sykes arrived in Aleppo, he had a number of tasks, but one of them was to interview Armenian survivors and report on their condition. And in these few days in Aleppo, uh, he re-encountered Ohanesian, immediately connected him with Ronald Storrs in Jerusalem. And of course, other British officers had also seen Ohanesian's tile work in Sledmere House in Yorkshire, Sykes' estate. And they agreed when he recommended him to the pro-Jerusalem society. So the Ohanessians arrived in Palestine from Syria at the end of 1918. Ohanessian began a series of experiments testing the local clays and woods. And after no success over six months, he requested safe transit documents to return to Kutahia to obtain the necessary materials. When he returned to Jerusalem, he also brought the remaining Armenian ceramicists there, which included Nishan Balyan, a gifted wheel potter, 
and Mugurdich Karakashian, who was uh, an expert painter. And Ohanesian named his new studio on the Via Dolorosa, the Dome of the Rock Tiles. He cooperated with Near East Relief, which placed orphans with him as apprentices. And the Pro-Jerusalem Society under Ashby gave him lots of commissions. Um, here's a very well-known Jerusalem image. You can find it in the uh, Library of Congress in the photo collection, uh, but you can also find it for sale in Jerusalem. It's, it's reproduced and sold, very kind of nostalgic. Um, but what's less well known is that most of these children were orphaned in the Armenian genocide. They were placed with Ohanesian to learn a trade and a number of them took to the art, became very accomplished and remained with him until 1948. Here's where this picture speaks back to history. Um, some well-known art historians, I will say primarily British, uh, who've written about uh, early Jerusalem ceramics, it sort of dismissed the art form, these kind of loosely painted but brilliantly glazed pieces. Here's an example of one in color, so you can see. Um, so these pieces characterize this post-World War I period of Jerusalem ceramics, but what these Art historians did not recognize is that they were actually the products of orphans' children who were striving to learn a craft to eventually become self-supporting amid general conditions of poverty, hunger, and really unthinkable loss. At the same time, Ohanesian and his team were creating uh, install and installing replacement tiles on the Dome of the Rock, effecting a partial renovation. And he used his expertise um, and his flair for marketing to promote his products and to kind of rebuild international export channels. Again, Pro-Jerusalem Society gave him some important commissions like producing these trilingual street name tiles for the old city. Uh, Ashby commissioned Ohanesian to make a faience model of the Dome of the Rock as a wedding gift for the British Princess Mary. And in 1922, Balian and Karakashian left Ohnesin's employ and they founded their own joint studio outside the old city on Nablus Road. So this would become Palestine's second Armenian ceramics workshop. Here we see the Ohnesin family in 1923, one of many families in Jerusalem in this period, striving to recreate a sense of an ordered life and to regain some prosperity after years of war and trauma. And as other families rebuilt their businesses, they hired local architects to design villas and apartment buildings. And then the 1920s and 30s, Ohanesian carried over to Jerusalem this old Ottoman tradition of exterior architectural tile embellishment. The British mandate uh, government required that all new construction in Jerusalem uh, be built with local limestone. So the only colorful features that were permitted were these Ohanesian tiled embellishments. And again, as you walk around Jerusalem, you see many of them still in place today. In Jerusalem, Ohanesian also expanded the scope of his designs, sometimes including Christian imagery inspired by Armenian illuminations. Uh, he continued to rebuild his export network and he exported his wares uh, through the American colony stores to New York City and through Liberties of London. He participated in international expositions, including the Chicago World's Fair of 1933, where his name is once again misspelled. He created monumental tile installations in the Middle East, in Europe, and in the United States, and many of these also remain in place. So in Jerusalem, Onesian rigorously attempted to preserve the historic Anatolian ceramic making techniques, even in spite of Palestine's very different geological environment and the lack of the specific clays and other minerals that characterize the Anatolian ceramic tradition. To the very end of his career in the 1940s, he maintained the use of a traditional wood burning kiln and he ground glazes from raw materials. He designed and executed architectural tile work for new commissions designed by British mandate architects. And the most complex of these was a fountain niche of Cuerda Seca tile for a new museum funded by John D. Rockefeller to display the Holy Land's antiquities. So here you see it from the outside and here you see from the inside, which opened to the public in early 1938 
called the Palestine Archaeological Museum. For me, probably the most personal creation in Jerusalem uh, by my grandfather is the now uh, badly damaged and somewhat restored since this photo memorial altar created in 1928 for the Armenian convent of Saint Savior. And it bears a dedication tile made by him 10 years after he first arrived in the Palestine as a refugee. And it reads, Tavit Ohanesin of Kutahia in the year of the Lord 1919, established the art of ceramics in Jerusalem and in his workshop prepared the tiles for this holy altar dedicated at the gate of Saint Savior Monastery in memory of his parents and all the deceased in the year of the Lord 1928. A 1944 article in the Palestine Post celebrated the 25th anniversary of the tradition and it characterized Ohanesian as, quote, an artist of the old type worthy of the tradition he has carried over to our days. Ohanesian continued to produce pottery and tiles in his workshop on the Via Dolorosa until the beginning of 1948. One by one, the family fled Jerusalem's bombings and sniper fire and scattered to England, Soviet Armenia, Damascus, Cairo, and then Beirut, where Ohanesian died in 1953. The retiling, the complete retiling of the Dome of the Rock was not completed until the mid-1960s, and in the end, the tiles were actually made in Kutahia by the Chinichiolu firm, descendants of Mehmet Amin, and they were shipped to Jerusalem. The joint Balian Karakashian workshop continued operating until the deaths of the original partners in the 1960s, uh, at which time their descendants opened separate workshops. In 1954, the French Armenian painter Marie Alexanian married into the Balian family and introduced an original design vocabulary to Jerusalem tile work. And she was honored by the Smithsonian in 1922 with a solo exhibition. So the Balian family workshop remains on Nablus Road outside the old city, and they continue to incorporate new design ideas and advanced technologies into their creations. The Karakashian family continues to produce exquisite pottery and tiles in their studio and shop on Greek Orthodox Patriarchate Street in Jerusalem. I'm telling you all this so that when tourism starts again, you can go visit all these places. So here we see just a snippet of video, Hagop Karakashian, the grandson of Mukherjee, at work in his studio, continuing to, pr to produce like hand decoration in this time-honored manner. And other Armenian families have also founded studios in Jerusalem. Some Bruni brothers, Garo, George, and Harry, each with his own shop. Uh, George Sandruni's shop you see here just outside the New Gate. And we have Vic Lepegin, um, whose shop is just a few steps from the entrance to the Armenian St. James complex. Hagop Antriasian, we see him in his yeah. shop. <laughs> That's not me, somebody's <laughs> mic is on. So in a remarkable recent development, a new branch of Kutahia style Armenian ceramics is now taking root in Gumri, which is Armenia's second largest city, which was, has been struggling for a long time to recover from a devastating earthquake in 1988, in which more than uh, 50,000 died and 100,000 were injured. So in Gumri, a new generation of young Armenians is learning this art. And I certainly uh, look forward to the day when we can visit these artists again. In 2017, Armenian's Postal Service also celebrated the whole lineage of these Armenian ceramics. So as we see, I hope, I think we have a Zoom bomber among us. Um, but in conclusion, I just want to end with uh, this beautiful plate made by my grandfather. Um, so this art continues to survive in Jerusalem and in Gumri from the gorgeous handmade objects uh, created in the artisanal studios that you just saw, to small trinkets that are made by some for tourists. And although it's an art that evokes the far distant past and was nearly extinguished after genocide and world war, it also pours forth today, continues to just spill forth today so alive, so vibrant in Jerusalem and Gumri, 
It's a transformed branch of an old Ottoman tradition. For me, it's an emblem of Armenian resilience and survival. Thank you very much, Sato, that was wonderful. Um, so the floor is open now, if anybody would like to ask questions. You Don't can ask shy. questions now, or we can also um, start just talking about a couple of the resources for um, gathering family histories. And then if people have questions about that, or if they have questions about the ceramics, uh, we can address any of this. How does that sound? Sounds good to me. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to ask you a question though right yes. now. Yes. You didn't mention this in your talk. Where does the title come from? Ah, <laughs> I should say, you have to read the book to, to find out. Um, so the title came. The title came because, I mean, it represents the ashes. Represent a number of things. First, on the most literal level, because my grandfather was perhaps one of the very last ceramicists to preserve this very old uh, Anatolian technique of tile making, and he used um, wood burning kilns, which resulted in ashes. Um, there's that. And then, of course, there's a sort of metaphorical sense of the, the, that the family was nearly destroyed in the Armenian genocide. And in both the literal sense of wood ashes and in the metaphorical sense of lives destroyed, um, he managed to recreate this feast of art, you know, this feast of brilliant work for the eye and of memory. So that was my inspiration for the title. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And the book is actually on sale right now at Stanford University Press, if you're ah, yes. intrigued. Um, for the next couple of days, it's, they're having a 40% off sale for uh, everything in their catalog. If you go to the Stanford University Press site, uh, it's actually cheaper than Amazon right now. So. Amazon, we don't do Amazon. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but now we have a choice. Now we have a choice, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I put all of, if nobody has pressing questions immediately, I put all the links to the, um, to the family histories. I wonder if Sato, if you'd like to describe some Sure, of sure. No, we, actually it have seem, a, uh, it... we actually have a question on the floor from Hazmi. Oh, oh I'm great. sorry. Do you want to ask me the question? Mm -hmm. Or read me the question? Yeah. Hi, Sato. I, I, Hi. Um, we met Hi. at the Armenian Institute evening in yes, London. Yes, I remember. And um, it's really nice to see you again. Thank you. And, um, uh, I was born in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and my grandfather was the baker at the Armenian Seminary and the Armenian Quarter. So what I have here is, I don't know what I have to do. Um, can you see? I can see it. It's twisted. Can you have it face your computer so that I see it directly? Uh, this looks um, like one of the Balian or Karakashian plates. Yeah, there's a signature at the back. This was a present to my parents when they got married in 1944. Mm. And at the back, there's a signature. Can you can you turn it over? Yeah, that's the Balian Karakashian sign from when they had the joint studio, which was between 1922 and the um, early 1960s that's a, uh, okay. a, a b and a k so yeah it's 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 signed by the the joint studio as they call it beautiful yes exactly okay okay well thank you very much sato it's been fascinating thank you hasmi <laughs> okay. okay so here i have an um no, this is a product of the of Dr. Salpi Razardian, who's the director of the University of Southern California Armenian Center. And she and her team have developed a questionnaire. And I, I believe the link is in the chat box now. Yes, um, it is. Now, these questions, as they've developed it, them, pertain to Armenians, but they're very, very easily adaptable for anyone. And I would really urge, especially the students who are here, and especially, say, if you're quarantining at home, um, 
you know, use some of the time that you have, pick up your iPhone or your iPad or whatever, and conduct some interviews. Um, if you are seeing older family members at holidays or living with older family members, this is probably the perfect time in this standing still moment of the world to collect family stories because as annoying as it might be to hear someone, you know, an 85 year old relative repeat the same story again and again, there might actually be a reason why you're hearing that story again and again. And it might actually signify something in your family's past that you might want to know more about in the future. So um, this link to the questionnaire uh, gives a lot of really detailed information on conducting, how do you conduct uh, an interview? How do you conduct a generational interview? Um, if it's anything related to Armenian stories, you're invited to contribute it to the um, collection of Armenian uh, testimonies that are being assembled at USC. Um, yeah, I don't know how these blue marks got here. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Anyway, as you can see, um, this gives a sort of detailed guide for how to lead the interviewee into the process of recovering memories. I mean, there are a lot of like sort of time tested techniques for helping people, um, you know, think about things that they might not have thought about for a while or think gently about difficult memories and, you know, begin to uncover them. As I said, these can be adapted for any group or pretty much any circumstance. And so I highly recommend that you take a look there. You'll see not only these questionnaires and instructions for how to conduct them, but you'll also see sort of related things, um, resources for various groups, the, the, the Shoah archive uh, at, that's housed at University of Southern California that contains uh, many, many testimonies of, of Jewish genocide survivors also. So, you know, even if you're in a state of life, 19 years old, 20 years old, before you're really thinking about your family's distant past, this is the time to capture the information and to save it. And it's never, ever been easier than it is now uh, with the tools that we have completely, you know, in our pockets and at our disposal. Um, another project, a fabulous project, is this Husham Adyan um, out of Berlin, which is an Armenian project to kind of reconstruct the material, spiritual, cultural world of Armenian villages throughout the Ottoman Empire, which are completely silenced today, built over, repurposed. And so what Husham Adyan has done is to create a centralized place where they digitize people's private um, objects and share them to, in the virtual world, reconstruct Ottoman Armenian life. And people contribute what they call uh, family micro histories. If you go there, you'll see um, it's, a, it's a very rich website. You'll see on this page for Open Digital Archive um, on the left, a menu by location. So you can choose uh, family histories from the Americas, from Armenia, Europe, Middle East. And if you click on them, you'll, you'll see how other people are handling this, but um, I can't urge this enough, this whole practice of, of collecting memory in this way. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm very happy to answer. I'm gonna stop the screen sharing now. We, we do have a couple of questions. Great. Um, so from the chat, I'll go with the chat first. Uh, I'm, I'm fearful of mispronouncing your name, Serena, so my apologies in advance. Serena Pelen Pelengrian, this was a beautiful presentation. How long did this take you? What was the thought process throughout? And what do you think this kind of work does for our people? Thank you for being here and for asking those questions. So it took me about 10 years between starting to kind of casually research and then intensifying the research. Um, my drive was really came out of two things. One was that I was trying to kind of come to terms with the legacy of intergenerational trauma as it manifested in myself. I spent the first few decades of my life 
really struggling with like severe depression and very bizarre kinds of things. For example, I had a terror of going in the subway because I feared that if I stood at the edge of the subway, someone would come and push me in. I had a fear of uh, going places, crowded places, being separated from, this is before the iPhone you know, made life easier. I, I would get panic attacks if I were separated from the people that, I mean, under the most innocuous of circumstances, a shopping mall, a park, whatever, if somebody didn't show up exactly at the moment I expected them, or if we were somehow separated in a crowd, I would entirely panic. And this is not just an Armenian thing. This is, you know, this is a thing. There are so many groups who carry in their bodies the legacy of intergenerational trauma. And like me, they may not even recognize that, that that's what they're carrying with them. So for me, it was a long, long process of um, therapy, psychotherapy, and of what my therapist called bibliotherapy of like needing to read the whole sort of um, psychoanalytic literature about object relations and attachment theory and intergenerational transmission of trauma until I had a, an idea of you know, how this, these forces were at work in me and until I understood what were some of the steps that I actually could take to retrain my brain. That was one thread of this. The other thread was the fact that as I kept reading all these things, these you know, beautiful books that were produced about Jerusalem ceramics and Kutahia ceramics, that there was always this gap. Everybody said these two schools are related, but nobody would touch the subject of how the art transferred from one place to the other. So I felt that I was in a position, especially with the help of my family who had you know, uh, kept so many pieces of documentation, I felt that I was in a position to actually do the research, write this all out, connect the two schools, honor my grandparents' legacy. And it was an extremely uh, deeply gratifying, spiritually fulfilling thing to have done. Did I answer all the questions or did I leave something out? I think you answered everything. Okay. <laughs> um, my counterpart, Rustin Zakhar at, uh, from UNC has a question. He, he runs Ajem Media, which maybe you've come across. Yes, Fantastic yes, the collective, person. yes. Yeah, he's a good person. Hi. Hi. I'm okay. I'm an okay person. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sato, how are you? Uh, Hi. Thank you so much for a uh, brilliant talk. Um, you've kind of already touched on some of the, the, the questions that I had um, is more specifically about um, oral history and conducting research with inter, uh, intergenerational history, um, producing intergenerational testimonials uh, when there are silences due to mm. trauma. Mm. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, your own research, but also, you know, Hush Madian has a, has a great project and I'm sure that um, the the project that um, that you've hinted at probably has some questions uh, directed towards trying to parse out some of these uh, uh, issues of silence. Um, and I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Um, I know that there are other projects that exist outside of the Armenian context. Uh, 1947 Partition Archive with India mm -hmm. and Pakistan is one that does a lot of great oral histories that also has to deal with, um, let's say, a generation of silence um, of people affected by displacement and, and, uh, and inter-ethnic violence. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, in your own experience or with projects that you're familiar with, um, especially when you know family politics and family history can get really contested and very difficult, how does one approach um, a family member? Because I know that, you know, speaking to a family member, a grandfather is very different from speaking to a stranger. It's very different from speaking to a friend. Yeah. Um, when there are power relations, when there are um, understandings that this person has uh, is inherently silent about a topic, how do you, how are you able to kind of create an environment that allows people to share? this painful, uh, these painful memories. Yeah, and I, I mean, I also want to point out one other very like large strand of this in the United States is uh, the African-American history and uh, uh, you know, talking about silencing. Um, you know, I would think we see in the response to the 1619 project, like the, you know, the uproar around it, which is, you know, feels very familiar to me as an Armenian whose history of genocide, you know, perpetrated by Ottoman Turks 
has also been, you know, the the object of uh, like lots of lobbying money and and you know so that's on the macro scale, on the micro scale, um, you know I think that the contribution of any one or any two people is enormously important in filling in these larger histories and these larger silences because, you know some historian can yell at some other historian like no you know this is fake news or whatever. But you can't say that the interview that I conducted with my grandfather, with my grandfather's memories of his own experiences is invalid. And this is why I think it's crucially important to have these one-on-one -on -one encounters. And Salpi Ghazaryan's uh, guide that you see there is, is actually really very thoughtful and very detailed way of approaching people in, as you're saying, contexts of imbalances of power, even within a family. And you know, you can't you can't force someone to talk about something that's too painful for them to contemplate for whatever reason that is. But that's that's a memory too. And that's something also worth capturing too. And so if you're getting a stone wall from someone, you can record your own thoughts at the moment, because you might be able to actually unpack your own thoughts differently 10 or 20 years in the future. The other thing is um, to keep documents, to, di to digitize documents, if at all possible, because you know even all the important uh, things in a, in a box in someone's closet, I mean, God forbid there could be a house fire or you know some other circumstance. So because it's so much easier to do this now and because you can back up uh, scans of things in clouds, um, that's what I could re recommend. I, it's probably not a satisfying answer for you, but my answer is the power of one uh, cannot be overestimated. Anyone else? Thank you. Oh, and also, and also, to, oh, sorry, Brittany. Um, also, uh, Husha Madian is a great model, um, and anybody can use that as a model. Um, you know, it's, I don't know, you know, people rail a lot about social media and the internet and the pernicious influence. And I agree with all that, but it's also nearly miraculous. And had I not met, for example, somebody on Instagram who was translating the Arabic calligraphy on some of my grandfather's tiles and who subsequently became the, the director of the Palestinian Museum in Birzeit or somebody else who introduced me to uh, a religious historian in Beirut who's able to go into the walk there and do some research on my behalf. I mean, it's social media that brought us together. So that's also like an incredibly valuable tool for finding people who come from the same place you come from, have, have a similar psychological issue to you, are also interested in storytelling, you know, or have aesthetic interests in common. So like for all the ills, that the internet brings, it also brings like miracles when it comes to reconstructing the past of diasporic people. Brittany, sorry. Cut You're you fine. <laughs> um, thank you for this talk, it really was beautiful. Um, thank you. I was wondering if there was um, a part in your grandfather's story where you hit a brick wall or there is a, a gap in time where you just couldn't trace him. And if there was, how were you able to, to deal with that? Um, or move past that? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there are always those brick wall times. I mean, I think in early, early on, even before I started thinking about amassing all this, you know, when it was just sort of like a vague idea, um, I did get kind of stuck. Um, what I learned to do over time is if I hit a brick wall, put it aside, step aside, research around it interview around it. And very often uh, when I would come back to it, it, the wall wouldn't be there anymore. But I think also it's very helpful to find like a like-minded pod of people. Um, you know, even if everybody's specific issues are different, um, just to be able to share processes, share encouragement and moral support. Anyone else?
Hi, Sylvia. <laughs> Hi, Sato. I'll ask a question. Um, Sato, that was so beautiful. Uh, I really, really loved getting to hear you talk. Um, one thing as you were talking um, that I was thinking about a lot, mainly because uh, I feel like you could understand this because both of us being Armenian and um, sort of navigating this insider, outsider, uh, you know, very fine line that we try to do when we're, when, when we're writing for audiences that are both within ourselves and outside. And, you know, the thing that I know I struggle with in my work is there's this sense that, you know, there's this narrative that we have to get out there, you know, for, for the Armenian people, for our people. But at the same time, there are narratives that we know that we don't want to keep playing into. And so, so I was just as concerned about angering my people as I was, you know, like, like, you know, saying something that was going to, you know, not, I, I don't know, it's, it's difficult, you know, this sort of insider outsider. Thing. So I'm wondering if you came upon those moments where you thought, okay, this is not quite what I should be saying or, or, or how am I, this is a sort of tricky moment for me right now in terms of how I'm going to, to, to navigate this narrative. Well, my interest was in kind of complexifying the story because when I started in this process, you know, I turned to my family and I said, tell me everything you know about the Armenian genocide. And so they said, well, it started on April 24th, a million and a half Armenians were slaughtered. And that was pretty much, you know, that was pretty much the scope of it. And um, it's actually easier for somebody who wishes to put out the idea that this didn't happen or that it's contested or something like that. It's actually easier for somebody to slap back against a statement like that than it is, as I was saying earlier, to slap back against me describing in detail the artistic tradition that my grandfather practiced in Kutahia, in the interior of the Anatolian Peninsula, in a conservative, only Turkish speaking place where he actually worked with, you know, Turkish arts artists. I mean, there were like, there were Armenians, there were Greeks, there were Turks. Um, it's a lot harder for somebody to say, no, that's fake news or whatever, when you're giving a specific granular picture of, I don't know if that's the kind of um, thing you're talking about, or if you're talking about internally, you know, that not uh, stepping over certain lines or portraying things only in a certain way. I mean, you know, it's the 21st century and, um, there are so many different subtleties of opinion and so many different like platforms for, for uh, elaborating on them. Um, I didn't really have the experience of, um, I didn't have the pushback that you're talking about, but I can certainly think of several authors who wrote things over the last five years that were published and you know, who one who expressed a kind of controversial point of view, but you know, that person deserves to have the controversial point of view and it was published and well published. So I don't know if I'm addressing what you're asking. If there's more, tell me. No, no, absolutely. No, no, that was it entirely. Just um, the complexities that come with writing as, you know, as much as I hate these uh, distinctions in, as an insider, you know, and um, you're, not, you're having to navigate so many different expectations and, and I know it, it can be quite challenging. And I think you you do it so beautifully and, and seamlessly in, in the in the book. So I'm wondering what what do we not see? Yeah. Well, that's really, really kind of you. And and I also would want to point out an article. I'm sorry, I don't have it for the chat box, but Bedros Dermatosyan had uh, the great Armenian scholar at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, um, had written an article about the difficulty. Now, this is a few years old, but he'd written about the difficulty of using memoirs and diaries and testimonies from the parties who had been injured in um, speaking on the subject of mass atrocity uh, crimes against humanity. And it's, this is why these stories are so important because it's much easier for people to say, oh, you know, no, you can't rewrite the history of the United States. It's, it's much easier for people to say, you can't rewrite the history of the United States than it is to say to a person who has documented 
their own family's history to the extent that they can, including all the silences that are inherent in that, all the suppressed parts that are inherent in that, that too is part of history. And I think, you know, as the world marches on, it's an increasingly important part of history. And as it becomes easier and easier to share these stories, we're gonna be building a body of work, a body of work that testifies to a particular human experience. Uh, I'm just gonna build on this a little bit. It, what about the episode in which David became Ahmed Muhtar? Well, let's say that he didn't become Ahmed Muhtar. His wife's life was threatened. Yeah. Um, he was forcibly converted. It was an extraordinarily painful experience for him that I didn't actually even know until seven or eight years ago, something like that. And when I learned, I was stunned and just devastated. I mean, I was devastated. Um, but then there it was in the Ottoman archives, you know, I mean, knowing that enabled us to actually find his deportation documents. There's a whole folder of deportation documents that, you know, gave us the history. I mean, that incredibly painful memory was like the doorway to recovering more of our own family's past. But what I was talking about earlier, my own process in therapy, my own process of, um, you know, doing EMDR and, and uh, trying a lot of different modalities to deal with the relics of this uh, intergen intergenerational um, manifestations of trauma, um, <laughs> all of this is connected. All of this is connected. And um, if I hadn't written, written the book, I don't think I would have really been in a good place. If I hadn't done the EMDR you know, 15 years ago, I might not have been able to write the book. So we are all the containers <laughs> of history. And I don't know, for me, it seems like part of living a, a, a gratifying, fulfilled life is to know who we are, where we come from, what did our ancestors endure? What did they contribute to the world? You know, it's, it works in all directions. But for me at this point, I, I think it's just a, an incredibly valuable thing to do. So I'm going to become an evangelist, <laughs> an evangelist of collecting family histories, which doesn't mean that anybody has to write a book or do anything, but just at least think about it for five minutes. That's all I ask. And Wonderful. also think about weirdnesses in ourselves. What's weird? Is there something that's incongruent, you know, with the way the rest of your life goes? Are you living your life in a certain way, but some thought keeps coming into your head or some impulse comes into your head or you find yourself extremely interested by something odd? That might be our ancestors like trying to speak to us. So I'm just saying to listen, you know, to pay attention. If there are no more questions, we are now at quarter after one Eastern time. So our time is up. Um, I want to thank Sato so very much. This was really wonderful. Uh, thank all of you for coming and attending this session, um, giving us your time. Uh, the next kind of iteration of this series will take place on the 19th of February with uh, Malte Furman, my colleague Adam Mestian, who's here, and I will uh, We'll have a conversation with Malte about uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Mediterranean and port cities. So could be fun. <laughs> so thank you all very, very much. This is really wonderful. Um, if you have questions, follow-ups, send an email and we'll be in touch. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for showing up. And Sean, can you save the chat for me? Uh, Griffin, can you save that? That should be saved. Okay. Should be saved. I don't All know right. how to do these things. There was there was one comment that I didn't read just because I didn't get a response from um, Dr. Paul Manuk.
who noted that in Ireland, there are par apparently, um, there are apparently uh, tiles that he's discovered. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland. yeah, at uh, um, uh, Mount Stewart House. Is that what you're talking about? He doesn't specify, and I think he's no longer here. Uh, he's on. Okay. No, yeah, Paul, Paul? Paul is here. I think he's here. Yeah, he is. And um, he just says, we even have some examples in Ireland. And oh, yeah, that's, that, that's showing... at Mount Stewart House. So it's like E of Lady Londonary. Uh, yeah, and uh, that was a commission uh, that my grandfather made. And wow. actually, um, Oh gosh, I've written about this whole episode. It's in the book. It's in the uh, next to last chapter, I think. Yeah, that's it. Hasmi, wow. you have pictures of it. Yeah. So oh, has Paul been... is a friend of mine, Paul and Isabel. Ah, yes. okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So and yeah, so Isabel is Irish, so they go. So it with... was Edith Lady Londonderry who who was in uh, Jerusalem. Yeah who came to my grandfather's studio and met him and commissioned uh, this thing, which was also exhibited at um, some British industrial exposition uh, at the time before it was installed in the Spanish garden of uh, Mount Stewart House, but which is open to the public at certain times. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, very beautiful version of the bird, the bird pattern, which is inspired by the Armenian bird mosaic of the fifth, sixth century in Jerusalem. Just so beautiful. We, we, we can hear you, Paul. Okay, it's actually Isabel speaking. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a different voice, Paul. <laughs> I, was, I was the one. Sorry, who... Isabel. I was the one who discovered it here, but um, I'm, I'm probably more interested in the Armenian history than my husband, who is Armenian. <laughs> <laughs> well, Isabel, I've written about this in the book, so I don't know if you have access to the book, but... Oh, yes, I've read it and, and lent it, and I haven't got it back. I'm oh. waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I keep advertising it. Oh, that's very, very kind of you. Thank you. And my daughter, in actual fact, is working at Duke University at the moment. Ah. So she is. Great. All right. Well, um, OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody being here and, you know, Sean, Griffin, and everybody else. Thank you. So I'm going to sign off, I think, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it right now. OK. Okay. Thank you all for showing up. See you next Bye. time. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.